I'm Dr. Ross McQuivy, Chief Medical Officer at Clinical Innovations, as well as an adjunct clinical faculty member at Stanford University's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. It's my privilege today to talk to you about a way to reduce the primary cesarean section rate, and that is through a practical approach of improving our outcomes in vacuum assisted delivery. Now, I had the good fortune of working with one of the true visionaries in vacuum delivery, and that of Dr. Aldo Vaca. Dr. Vaca's approach to vacuum was very different than anything I had been exposed to during my training or afterwards. And as I have implemented what I like to call the Vaca principles, I've seen a tremendous change, not only in the outcomes of my deliveries, but also a significant increase in the success in the deliveries that I choose to take on. To emphasize the difference between rigid stem centrally located cups and the more maneuverable low profiled cups, I'd like to demonstrate using this pelvic model. If we place this baby straight occiput anterior and at the outlet, you'll see that the flexion point three centimeters forward of the posterior fontanelle, a long sagittal suture, essentially is my presenting part. So I could take any cup on the table, rigid stemmed or not, and place it on that spot and essentially get that baby delivered with little effort. As you know, babies who need our assistance rarely present straight occiput anterior and at the outlet. But let's make it a little more realistic and put it in a low station and add just slight rotation to, so it is left occiput anterior. Now this is still a delivery in which I'd let my intern do, but notice what it's done to the presenting part and what it's done to the flexion point. Presenting part now has become mainly the right parietal bone and the flexion point is actually moved down three centimeters along sagittal suture away from where we can get access by using a rigid stemmed cup. If we place that rigid stem cup on this spot, you can see that we're essentially placing it on the majority of the right parietal bone of the fetal head, and we're trying to drag the baby down in an oblique fashion, not in the axis of the pelvis, which is going to require more force and increase the chances the cup comes off and causes scalp lacerations or abrasions. Now some people say that you don't give this cup enough credit and one of the benefits of the soft design is that you can collapse them. And perhaps you could collapse the cup enough that you could move it so that you could get it over that so-called flexion point. The problem with that is this. There's not a physician in this room or listening to this lecture who would pull in that direction to deliver this baby. We obviously all pull along the curve of carus or along the axis of the pelvis, which is in this direction. The only problem with that is, is rigid stemmed cups are designed to be pulled at 90 degrees from their attachment. So as soon as we try to pull in the axis of the birth canal, we end up popping the cup off and causing abrasions. Now the beautiful part in the design of the maneuverable cup, what it allows us to do is we don't have to leave the cup in that position on the presenting part. We can actually slide the cup down over the flexion point and then let the stem follow out of the introitus and because it's not a rigid stem, as we pull in the axis of the pelvis, it doesn't create a vector of force that's gonna pop the cup off, but essentially is gonna guide that baby's head along the axis of the birth canal. So in the occiput posterior position, Again, the presenting part becomes the anterior fontanelle. The posterior fontanelle is all the way back here and the flexion point is just three centimeters forward here. So by using a rigid stemmed cup, we're essentially forced to put it here, which is way too far forward over the anterior fontanelle, which does nothing to the problem of this baby. The problem with this baby is it lacks flexion. It does not have chin to chest mobility or movement and so it presents a very large anterior posterior diameter of the fetal head to the maternal pelvis which is going to require more force to bring across the perineum. Now even with an incredibly ugly recto episiotomy that mom could never forgive me for, I still couldn't get that cup in proper position. 
The beautiful part of the maneuverable stemmed cup is what it allows us to do is not leave it here on the presenting part, but actually push it back over the flexion point and then the let the stem follow like a tail so that when I provide traction in the axis of the pelvis, I'll actually encourage that chin to chest movement or flexion of the fetal head that'll present the smallest diameter of the head to the maternal pelvis and allow the normal process of labor to take place. To demonstrate the best practice of consistently getting your cup on the flexion point every single time, it's important to understand what Dr. Aldo Vaca was talking about when he emphasized measuring the distance from the posterior fourchette to the flexion point. Now we all have a natural ruler on our hand or a measuring instrument and that is if we know the distance from the middle finger, examining finger, to that interphalangeal joint, you'll see that it is between five and six centimeters and to the metacarpal joint on the hand, that's between 10 and 11 centimeters. If we understand that, during our vaginal exam, we can determine the distance from the flexion point to the perineum or where the posterior fourchette comes in contact with your hand. Now that is to reference the marks that are found on the Kiwi Omni Cup. On every Kiwi Omni Cup there are marks that are found on the stem at 6 and 11 centimeters. Those marks are to coincide with the marks that are naturally found on your hand. Step number one is to check position and station of this baby. In this instance, this baby is right occiput posterior at plus one station. Now I find the flexion point, three centimeters four to the posterior fontanelle, a long sagittal suture. I rest my hand on the perineum and I determine from the middle finger to that part of my hand is approximately eight centimeters. Step number two is to hold and insert the cup. So place one finger in the vagina or two, pulling downwards to create room and then sliding the cup on its side as small as possible. Once it's flat against the fetal head, rotating it up flat and then removing your hands. In step two, when placing the cup, the easiest way of keeping track of the groove is to place one's thumb on the top of the groove. When the cup is inserted into the vagina, the groove goes in at 9 o'clock and then as the elbow is rotated upwards, the groove is naturally placed at 12 o'clock. Step number three is to maneuver the cup to the predetermined distance, which in this baby was eight centimeters. So I insert two index fingers, the superior hand holding tissue up and out of the way, the inferior hand right up on top of the edge of the cup and pushing downwards. As I push down, you can see the stem shortening. I'm now at the six centimeter mark and I continue to push. There's seven centimeters and there's eight centimeters. I hold or stabilize the cup with my superior hand and I use my other hand to establish vacuum. Step number four is to establish vacuum and also exclude maternal tissue that may be trapped underneath the cup as the vacuum is applied. Step number five is to place the thumb on the cup and the index finger on the baby's head to prevent that cup from coming off and providing counter traction during our pulling efforts. As mom begins to push, we will provide our traction in a downward angle in this baby who is right occiput posterior. As the baby gets further and further down in the pelvis, notice the direction of pull changes. until I begin to finish here as the baby 
reaches the perineum and you can see where the cup was placed.